Good job. <laughs> I thought Robbie, sorry. I thought Robbie liked you folks. He put me on back to back. I wasn't sure what that's supposed to mean. So I subjected you to me three times in a row. Maybe let's get rid of this guy quick and then we have Steve come back and he'll finish it up and that's what you remember. So I'm not exactly sure what the placement means. Yeah, right. Maybe we couldn't take Steve. What I want to look at is this idea of poetry. I want to look at one genre of the Psalms. And my reason for looking at this one genre is because I believe it's so vitally important that the church needs to get a handle on. And it's the idea of laments. The Psalms do not simply express emotion. When sung in faith, they actually shape the emotion of the godly. The emotions are not, therefore, not a problem to be solved, but are part of the raw material of the now fallen humanity that can be shaped to good and noble ends. The largest category in the Psalter is the Lament Psalm. Approximately one-third of them fall into this category. And based on the work of the higher critics like Gunkel and Westerman, we can see general outlines, and they are helpful for providing these outlines, especially when we want to be able to preach and teach and even counsel. These lament psalms are great for helping somebody who's going through a tough time. And I'm convinced we all know people are going through tough times. The lament psalms gives them voice, which is vitally important. Alan Ross notes, grief is universal, cross-cultural reaction to loss and change. And I've gotten old enough now to realize that nothing stays the same. We can just look in the mirror. <laughs> and you wonder who that person is looking back at you. That's lost their hair because of cancer. When a month ago, you didn't even know what that cancer was. We go through loss. When you look in the mirror and you're looking in the mirror and you're alone. Because there used to be someone sitting next to you, standing next to you. And that person's gone. The crib is empty. Your kid won't talk to you. We all experience loss and change. So I think it's important that we get a handle on these laments, because these laments give voice to our sorrow. And if we're honest, we really don't sing these songs in church on Sunday morning. Here, let's sing number 523, Lord, how long will you forget me? <laughs> we laugh. We won't sing it because it seems impolite. But we've all felt it. But somehow it's not polite to say that. Somehow we see it as a lack of faith. However, we see David saying it quite often. The theological significance of the personal lament lies first of all in the fact that it gives voice to the suffering. The lament is the language of suffering, and in it, suffering is giving the dignity of language. Leslie Allen remarks, in Shakespeare's Macbeth, the bereaved Macduff is told, Give sorrow words, the grief that does not speak. Whisper the overfraught heart and bids it break. Darley Soley has written in the needs to find language that leads out of the uncomprehended suffering that makes us mute, a language of lament, of crying, of pain. And she warns, silence can lead to the utter despair of suicide. And here we have one third of our psalms are in this genre of lament. 
So how important is it that suffering is given a voice? I mean, come on, most of us as pastors, what do we do? We go through suffering. We just suck it up. Isn't that the American thing to do? Suck it up. We don't tell anybody we're suffering. We don't share it because that's less than manly. But we see David constantly crying out his lament to God. The secret language of the Psalms lies in the fact that many people, many succeeding generations can recognize and utter it as their own prayer. The laments are legitimate parts of a robust adult faith which knows that God will not be shattered or provoked by strong words of protest. To ask where is God in the midst of one's suffering is based on the faith that God could do something about the circumstances if he chose to. And I would suggest that to complain to God, even about God, is an indication that we do believe there's a God. But so many times, suffering silences us into no words at all. And that's a sad place to be. Because the Psalms, even in the way the psalmist writes it, so many times in first person, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me? David's not saying forget him, like it's a third person, doesn't matter. It's forget me. And I'll confess, man, I've had my Bibles open. I laid it right there in Psalm 13. I said, Lord, how long? Forget me. I'm making that Psalm my own. And that's the beauty of the Psalm, to make the language my own. And what the Psalms do for me is when I don't know what to cry, when I don't know what to say because the pain, the loss. I come to these words and I read them and I find words that say, yes, this is how I'm feeling. And I can voice them to God. And in that is not just getting it off my chest. It's not that kind of therapy. What it does is it takes all these emotions that we're feeling. The loss, the loneliness, the grief, the hurt. And it's like a funnel. And it's all those feelings, they're voiced to God. I would suggest that the laments act as this funnel, taking all the emotions and giving them to God. Because on to our own, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to complain to you guys. Do you know what happened in my church this week? Let me give you a list. I'm just lamenting. Well, I'm sharing prayer requests, really what I'm doing. <laughs> what are they going to do? They're in the pastor too. And yeah, I, we were right there. But if I can lament this back to God, and what about the laments we don't share with each other? And we all have them. Because we don't want to be too transparent. That child that's disappointed us and walked away from the Lord and has broken our heart and continues to break our heart. Or the personal pain you don't share because it's just gotten old, God hasn't healed, and you just put up with the pain, the sickness, the diagnosis. Lament gives voice to our suffering. See, we're uncomfortable with lament. And where I see this really clearly is when someone dies. And I'm sorry if I step on toes here, but watch what happens. Someone dies on Wednesday. And one on Saturday, what do we have? A celebration of life. An oxymoron like if they're everyone's one. My wife just died, and I'm supposed to celebrate her life on Saturday. And if I don't, if I grieve, what you look at me and say, oh, you lack faith, Mark. She's in a better place. She's not with you. That must be better. <laughs> yes, she has been delivered. I understand that. <laughs> However, you want me to get over it in three days. I can't cry. I can't lament because somehow that's a lack of faith. See, lament gives voice to our suffering. See, in general, Alan observes, church services are uncomfortable and unsatisfying for one who grieves, for the services may reflect an aversion to sorrow that takes no account of the sober realities of life. 
We're uncomfortable with grief. We even changed, you know, our services. We used to have funerals. Now they're celebration. They're memorials. Let's remember the life. No. I think we're skipping a theological reality. She died. She's dead. She's not in my bed. She's not at my table. How can I voice that? Maybe it's a son, a daughter. See, laments allow us to voice these. Dr. Elizabeth Kuber Ross, expert on grief and dying, says, the reality is when someone dies, you will grieve forever. You don't get over the loss of a loved one. You learn to live with it. You'll heal and you'll rebuild yourself around the loss you have suffered. You will be whole again, but you will never be the same. Nor should you be the same, nor would you ever want to. But are we in the church comfortable with that? And in reality, the reason I want to bring in the lament psalms is because I don't hear them preached so often. Because we're uncomfortable. We're uncomfortable with somebody being angry at God. And that's what we see. And that's why I wanted to start with this. How comfortable are we? You know, why pray lament to God? And this is so critical. Westerman gets it right. The reason lament is so important. The one who laments his suffering to God does not remain in his lament. Every lament psalm, except possibly 88, and I've read an an article that even has elements in Psalm 88, there's always a movement from complaint to lament to praise. Always moves from complaint through petition to praise. However, it's not mathematical. It's not read these four verses and then you will eventually get to verse 5 where it's praise. No, it's a walking with God through the process. Your walk might be quicker than my walk. This is not take two psalm verses and call me in the morning. But sometimes that's how we treat the laments. Hey, read this lament psalm and you'll be okay. I'm never going to be okay. Read this lament psalm and this is how you can voice your hurt to God. Proven answer offers an answer why I pray to lament. The answer advocated in lament psalms is neither to give up on the goodness of God or to pretend that things are better than they are. In the lament psalms, we see honest confrontation the fact that there's a gap between theology on one hand and experience on the other. And this gap is brought to God in prayer and trust is renewed in God's goodness through the process of prayer. So I would suggest that we need these prayers of lament. But I need to tell you that some people in your church are uncomfortable with it. And if you just open your Bibles to Psalm 13, David, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? This sounds like a kid talking to his dad. How long do I have to put up with you, dad? You know, you said you'd give me an answer and I'm not seeing any answer. How long do I put up with this? And wait, 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 wait. You can't say that to God. David did. Yeah, but he didn't mean it. You know, his heart was right. If we stay in the text, what do we know about his heart? He's upset. And here is a man that God called a man after his what? If David can lament these laments, so can I. And not offend God because of my harsh language. Even Jesus on the cross prays a lament. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he knew more than we did. And he still prayed that lament, knowing what he's going to go through. If David and Jesus can pray the laments, so can we. But I would encourage you pastors, is do we in our churches have an environment where people are free to share and to grieve? Because I got news for you, it's uncomfortable. Because as guys, we somebody come in, 
they're grieving, we put our arms around them, and what do we say to them? It'll be okay. What in the world? It's never going to be okay. But we have to say something, and why can't we just be okay with silence? Hug them. I love them and say, can I share a psalm with you? Because David was right where you were. And it's okay to be there. And I want you to know we're here while you walk this. And we'll walk it through. But guys, we want to do what? Thank you from a woman in the second row. (laughs) If a guy can't fix it, we're wondering, what did I do wrong? I can always have a hammer. We'll always fix it. I'm always trying to solve problems for my wife. She comes home from work. She shares with me, and I'm saying, I can fix this. And she says, I'm just sharing. Oh, good. (laughs) Because I didn't know how to fix it, and I'm wondering. You left me off the hook. Sometimes just sharing. And that's what we have to let our people do. But it means setting up the environment. See, Israel, the Jews, had this environment. Their grief was a full-body experience. We've seen this in the New Testament, right? When somebody dies, the wailing. They had professional mourners that come in to set the environment. Now we say, oh, let's remember the life she lived. Doesn't that make you feel better? No, thank you. It doesn't because she's gone. I can't live that life anymore. So let's look at first interpreting the lament psalms. Number one. Read the lament in its literary and historical context. That's a first given point. But at the same time, don't go looking for situations in David's life that have to fit. I mean, Psalm 13, there is no superscription that tells us the historical background of the psalm. Matter of fact, as you read the psalm, we have no clue whatsoever what David is going through. Could it be his time running from Saul? Sure. Could it be his running from Absalom? Sure. Could it be running from the Philistines? Sure. We're not certain. All we know is he's been going for a long, long time through it. Psalm 51 is a good example. Hey, we have the historical context, so we can read that and we can understand it. This is where we go back to our previous session, apply the conventions of ancient Semitic poetry. We are reading poetry. So if you look at Psalm 13... How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? What is the literary device he's using there to communicate to us? Rhetorical question and what else? Repetition. You guys nailed it. But you have to be able to see that and explain it. I mean, he says how long, four times in only two verses to make his point. And if you read through that first two verses, look how many times the first person is used. It's fascinating. Will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? How long should I I take sorrow in my soul, my heart, my enemy over me? Who do you think he's worried about? Me? Me? And that's what pain does. Pain is always self-centering. Guys, ladies, when you hit your thumb with a hammer, who do you care about at the moment? (laughs) Okay, I was pastoring. My wife had surgery on Friday. She told me, I need you this weekend. Pastor, you will be here with me, right? I said, absolutely, woman. Anything you need, I'm here. Can I preach on Sunday morning? Yes. Then you come right home. I can handle this. So I took her to surgery. I was there. Took her home. She didn't want for anything. Saturday morning, get up, put her foot up. She's fine. My youngest son is cutting the grass. He cut the front perfect, goes to the back, and I tell my wife, I'm going out for five minutes, and all I'm going to do is change the wheel height on the lawnmower for my son, our son. Okay with that? She said, fine. I go outside, I change the front wheels, and I go to change the back wheels. But I didn't walk around the machine. I decided to lean over the machine. But I had to put my hand somewhere, so I decided to put it on the muffler. (laughs) 
That was New Jersey. I'm surprised you did not hear some scream. I come into the house. My hand, there's just blood and skin laying off. Put my hand into, under the water. My wife says, what did you do? And at that point, I'm saying, don't ask me. All I cared about was my pain. And she's looking at me. She says, did you hurt yourself? Does this mean you're not going to take care of me? <laughs> Three hours later, I did come back to take care of her. After I hit the emergency room, they cut off my reading wing and kept me from going into shock and second and third degree burns. Um, so the next day, I preached, and I preached on Job chapter 2, which I thought was somewhat ironic <laughs> that God would allow me to feel the pain. Try to discover the reason for... The lament. Now, it's interesting in chapter uh, 13 of Psalms, we're not really given the four. In a number of Psalms, it's there, four. You know, for the enemy is doing this. Here, time itself is the issue. Although the enemy might have started the problem, what the real issue here is, is seeming to last forever. Some of the situations I've found for causes of lament, sickness, either physical or spiritual, enemies, false accusations, physical harm, persecution, divine discipline because of sin, defeat in battle, time, or even God himself. And we have covered a number of those in our own lives. You know, explore the theological teaching of the lament. And ask yourself, not what's it teaching me about my pain, but what is the lament teaching me about God and my relationship with him? Look at the images that the metaphors or simile create by the author of the psalm will help you answer that question. Is he the rock? Is he a shield? Those will help you understand the lament. Again, we've been hitting this. Reflect and laments appeal to our emotion and our will. Longman says it this way. Does the psalm help us articulate what we're feeling? The lament psalms were written with this purpose in mind. They encourage believers brutal honesty in prayer life before God. And oftentimes the psalms are written in emotional language. Other times, there's a confidence expressed that's a matter of the will, not a matter of the emotion. For example, you may feel like David feels in Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel of my soul? Here's a man dealing with divine loneliness. That God has forgotten him. And that's how we feel, and it's okay to own that feeling. But recognize this. That's what he's feeling, but it's not reality. Because divine silence does not equal divine absence. Yes, God is silent in his life by not answering his prayer, but God is not absent from his life. And how do we know that David believes that? Because David is crying out to God. I mean, if you believe God is hiding from you, the reality is why would you ever call to him in the first place? It makes no sense if he's not there. You're in a dark room. You're talking to nobody. You believe he's there, even though he hasn't answered you. My wife says my humor leaves something to be desired, especially when it comes to my kids. But you understand, being a pastor, we lived in a small parsonage. So we used to play hide-and-go-seek, but the house was so small that my three older boys, we couldn't really play hide-and-go-seek well because you could see somebody hiding behind the couch, right? And then you had to move the couch out into the middle of the room, which gave a dead giveaway that someone was behind the couch. So what I did was I came up with the idea, let's turn off all the lights. My wife hated this game because someone always ended up screaming. So what I would do is kids go into the bedroom with mom. You count to 10, I'll go hide. And when I went to hide, I turn off the lights and I normally hit it in the same place, in the utility room, in the hamper. And this is what happened. 10... They come out, come running out. Then they stop. And every time we played the game, the same dynamic. They know I'm hiding. They know I'm not going to come out. And what do they say? 
Daddy. Oh, Daddy. Now, I'm hiding. They know I'm not going to come out. But why are they calling my name? They know I'm there. Now, granted, I would wait till they got closer and then touch them in the dark and make them scream. <laughs> I'm sorry, strange sense of humor, I know, but it was... they're still in therapy today because of, because of that. But this psalm shows almost the divine hide and seek. It's dark. We don't see any evidence of God. But even in the dark, when we're saying, how long do I have to stay in the dark? We still believe he's there. And I believe that helps the psalm as David moved from verse 4 to verse 5 of the psalm. Let me give you some exhortations. These songs are in the keys of our life. You know, it's easy to go to the praise psalms and the praise God, and that's good for us too, to thank God for all that he's done, but sometimes it is just good to lament. Even lament as a community. We had this happen during 9-11. My church was 16 miles away from the towers across the bay in New Jersey. But we could see the smoke. We had F-16s over the house. We, We were part of the scene. My county lost the most people in New Jersey in the towers because people would commute. And I had a great message on what that Tuesday or Wednesday <laughs> that I had to change real quick. And I came back to the lament Psalms. And that's the, the first time I saw the whole church lament as a whole. And you're going to experience the same thing. And that's what the lament Psalms as community do. See this lament that we're looking at in Psalm 13, this is called an individual lament. And this is meant for the individual, but there's some laments that have we in them that are not, we shouldn't flatten them out to be you lament, you lament. It's that we lament together. But I would encourage you to preach and teach the Psalms. Again, I know we don't have many lament Psalms, but can we use some in worship? It is well, my soul comes the closest probably, especially if you know the backstory. But everyone comes to church on Sunday, they look good. I can't tell what you're going through. But sometimes we need these psalms to express our hearts. Because not everything is going well that week. Use the psalms in counseling. Every one of us. If someone's going through hurt, they need to see God. You know, so many times people that go through hurt, they want to go to Job and they look for Job for a reason for their suffering. Well, there's no reason giving for their suffering. The only answer for suffering in Job is a who. And if I know the who in my life, I can understand the suffering in my life. I don't need to understand the why. The Lament Psalms help us. You don't need to understand the why you're going through cancer. You may not even know what God's teaching you. You may never know what God's teaching you. You have cancer. We live on this side of the fall. What you need is, how do you voice that emotion back to God? And you need to come alongside people and say, it is okay to voice this. You can say, I hate it. I don't like it. I'm afraid of what it's going to do to me. And the Psalms allow us to share that with God. And then you Psalms in evangelism. You know, people, they're in a hurting world. And we can help people by showing them that God understands hurting people. You know, the Christian life is not easy. But sometimes people look at you and say, hey, the Christian life is a piece of cake. And you can show them the reality. All right, let's look at the form of the lament of the individual, the individual lament psalm. I'm going to give you eight characteristics of the lament. First, there's, I'm, I'm going to say always, it's not always, there's eight, and I'm going to show you how the eight can be further broken down to what I call the cliff note version that David gives as well. But let me give you the eight that are possibly there. First is the address. This is a cry for help, turning to God. Then there's the mention of what's the problem, called the lament or the complaint. 
There's a confession of trust. There's a petition. This is a prayer what you want God to do because of it. So there's a petition for God to be favorable, for God to intervene. There's an assurance of being heard. God, I'm going through this problem. I trust you. I'm praying this, and I'm assured you'll hear me. Sometimes there's a second wish or a petition. Then there's a vow of praise, and then there is a praise. Now, I'm sorry. I'm a professor. So what I want you to do is look at Psalm 69 Get with somebody who's next to you and see if you can figure out all the parts that are there. I'm going to give you about three or four minutes, so read quick. Just do the best you can, but address what verse is the address, what verse is the lament, and it can go across across verses, and they may not be in order. So just take a look and see if you can do the first few. I'll give you three minutes, because I know you guys are good at this. You're a pastor, so we don't have to worry about it. All right, your time's up. We are official. You're not done, and I didn't expect you to be done in three minutes. This is just practice, okay? This is the fun part. This is a professor's trick to keep you awake after lunch. The more work you do, the less I have to do, and you're staying awake by doing something now, so I can get another 10, 15 minutes out of you really nicely, all right? 
So I would suggest, now remember, any psalmist worth his salt, this is generally the order. But if every psalm was this order, what would we do by the time we read the sixth one? Oh, kill me now. Come on, David, you couldn't be more original? And David knows because remember, he's dealing with the people that are what kind of necked people? Stiff necked. <laughs> so he uses poetry to get behind their stiffness. So they hear the word afresh. So he'll even change the form. What I would suggest is the address is verse 1. And it's pretty clear. Save me, O God, for the waters have drunk, have threatened my life. Now, I'll say it's the address, and even you get a reason for the waters have threatened me. Literary device there. For the waters have threatened me. Save me, O God. Now you say, maybe that's just the address. I don't like to break up lines because remember what we said previously is that two lines make up one thought. So I don't want to break them up. The way I will break them up is when I believe the NASB has made a mistake instead of being a bicolon, it should be a monocolon. So you can't always stress the layout in your Bible. So I would say the address is verse 1. The lament, the problem is verses 2, 3, and 4. That's the problem. But let's look at, look at the language. For waters have threatened my life. Now, is he really talking about drowning? Probably not. I don't think he's walking across a wadi and all of a sudden he slipped. Like, oh, I'm drowning. Which is reality. And remember, a Jewish family, Jewish father would always teach his th- kids three things. What were they? Torah, a trade, and how to swim. Because there's no bridges in Israel at this time. <laughs> so if you want to get across a wadi, you better learn how to swim during the... The rainy season. But why does he use the water metaphor here? Helplessness. Helplessness. How long can you hold your breath for? Most people can't go a minute. Your body may conserve a little bit after you pass out. You may go three. Not much more than three. Doesn't take long. Water is threatening. And if you've ever near drowned, you would know exactly what I mean. And the panic that sets in. And he goes on further. And this is a, it's threatened his life. And water does threaten your life because you need air to breathe. And it's threatened to take it away. And what? I have sunk in deep mire and there is no foothold. Anybody ever been in deep mud? Okay, watch what happens. You're in deep mud. And let's make believe it's tidal. That the tide comes in and out. Tides out, you're in mud. That's not too bad. But if you get stuck in the mud and the tide starts coming in, what happens? You're stuck. You're stuck. <laughs> I had this happen. I was in college, marine biologist, so we were going to get worm samples. Invertebrate zoology class. So a professor takes us out to the mud flats. He's got hip chest waders on. And he's walking out, low tide. We must have been 150, 200 feet offshore. And all of a sudden, he takes a step and he slips off the bedrock. And now he's in mud over his chest waders. Not too bad because the tide's out. But in New Jersey, the tide difference is about four feet. He's sticking up about a foot and a half. So we have some time, not a ton of it. So he tells me, don't come out. Absolutely, I'm going to listen this time. He says, hand me your shovel. So he starts trying to dig himself out because he can't, every time he moves, he slips deeper. He's trying to move mud. And what's happening? It's filling back in. He sets the shovel down and says, you guys, there was two of one, my, me and my friend. He said, you try to grab me and pull me. I said, this is not going to end well. So we're trying to pull and we have no foot. So we're pulling him, and it's not working. So he said, I'll go back to the shovel. He turns, the shovel's gone. That's how soupy the mud was. Someone must have saw us out there, the three of us, and they called the fire department. And the fire department has to come, throw him a rope, and they literally drag him out by the truck because it sucked him in so deep that men couldn't pull him out. And they dragged him across the mudflats. 
Why stop? You're, you know, you've got momentum. Don't stop now. <laughs> but this has always been a picture for me of that time. I have sunk in deep mire. There is no foothold. I've come into deep water and a flood overflows me. That's the picture. But that he didn't get out. That the water, the trouble is going to overflow. And I'm telling you, you tell this story. Use this imagery to people that are going through troubles. Yeah, I feel exactly like that. Have you had times in your life where troubles just seem to come on like a flood? I mean, if, you, if one thing happened that week that was bad, it'd be okay. It's when your wife's upset with you, the church is upset with you, your kids are upset with you, the dog's upset with you. The cat's never happy with you, but you know, you're used to that by now. But when everything goes wrong, this is what David's feeling like. And these troubles. And that's the picture he wants to paint in this complaint. But look at verse 5. And it may be the reason for his complaint is, maybe it's a sin. Or he's saying to God, oh God, it's you who know my folly. See, I would suggest that the confession of trust starts in 5 and probably goes through 12. Now, we may differ a little bit, and if we were in a classroom and we take time, we'd go around the room and ask the question, okay, what did you have and why? Because there is no grammar book that I can point to and say, you're right, I'm wrong. We haven't found that sixth grade Hebrew book from ancient Israel that says, oh, this is how lament breaks down, and let me show you how the psalm, the Psalter broke down. Then I go from the confession of trust, 5 through 12, I would suggest petition, 13 through 21. Because he says, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at acceptable time. And it seems the prayer goes from 13 all the way down to 21. Although there's some issue that maybe 20 and 21 are prob- part of the problem. So we'd have to talk about that one. There may not be an assurance of being heard. Now, it could be going back to verse 3. It depends what you want to do with that beeline. I'm weary with my crying, my throat is parched, my eyes fail while I wait for God. Now, is that the reason for his complaint? That's his complaint? Or is that a statement of trust? Every time I do this in my notes, I say, no, it's not an assurance of being heard. It's a problem. Today, I'm down to its assurance of being heard. So I go back and forth where to put this one. There does seem to be a double wish in 22. But this wish is not just a prayer, but a prayer, may their table before them become a snare. When they are in peace, may it become a trap. So here we see that the problem is an enemy. And God says, yeah, when they're sitting, when they're sitting down to eat, when they're at peace, let this become a snare. Then 30 through 33 seems like a vow of praise. I think it's a cohortative. I will praise the name of God. And then 34 through 36, praise of God. Let the heavens and earth praise in the sea and everything that moves in them. I think it's fascinating that he goes back to a water metaphor with seas. And so on. So we say, okay, Mark, we just went through, maybe this has the eight, maybe it has seven elements. What good does this do me? This is your outline, guys. This is how the text lays out. These are your points. You can't come to lament psalm and make the points your own points. Because this has a genre and these are the elements that are supposed to be there when you talk about lament psalm. And helping people go in and out of the emotions. Now again, I'll save that for a little bit. Okay, we could do the same thing for Psalm 55. And Psalm 55 is interesting because if you want to take time to look at that, there is no praise of God. And some of it, if you just maybe just look at the first few verses of it, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. That's verse 1. 
This is where I do believe the Nazbi made a mistake. I think that the opening verse should be a tricolon. Give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide your face from my supplication. Give heed to me and answer me. See, I think it should be a three-line introduction, not a two-line. And the reason I say that is based on the chiasm of the imperative give. I don't want to separate those. And then I do think it breaks down uh, nicely if you take out even verse 3, then you could have uh, either another bi, a tricolon and then a bicolon. So three lines, three lines, and two lines. However, if you go through the rest of the psalm, you'll see at the end, there is no praise. It's just simply a statement of trust. I will trust in you. All right, let's jump to Psalm 102. Is interesting. Here, I'll give you, give you another three minutes. This is a little bit shorter, only 20 verses. I'm going to give you three minutes. Have at it. <laughs> He's always complaining. I've never heard that much laughter when people studying the laments before. <laughs> Who said Bible study can't be fun with you guys? I'm not sure we got in the mood. Yeah. All right, Psalm 102. The address, I would suggest one and two. 
the lament, the problem, seems to be 3 through 11. Good. Wow. I was getting nervous if you didn't say yes, so you, I agree with you. Now, notice our Bibles probably are not breaking these up by stanzas. So that's problematic. I'm not sure if they should be stanzas because they're single verses, but notice that you have, confu- not confusion, but you have these elements in one stanza. Confession of trust seems to be 12 through 17. Petition, I would suggest there is none, at least not after these elements. The assurance of being heard may be 18 to 22. This will be written for the generation to come. The wish or petition may be 23 through 24. There seems to be no vow of praise. The praise of God seems to be 25 through 28. Now, it's interesting, if we look at this one, it has a second, you know, wish or petition, or, which is mean they didn't have even the first one in, the, in order after their confession. We have to be careful not flattening this out and putting it into the order we think it's supposed to be in. Sometimes you'll have a double lament. The lament comes first, then you'll have petition and uh, confidence, then the lament comes back again. And we tend, as pastors, we want to lump those up. Oh, this is all in point one, lament. And I suggest, let it go up and down. And why is it important to go up and down like this emotionally? That's life. That's how our emotions go. Sometimes, yeah, we complain to God. We get that confidence, and guess what? We start coming back up before you know it. Oh, my problem's not any better. And we go back down again. Let the problem go that way. And that's what David is, I believe, showing us even through the form of these psalms. Why is verse 18 Hold on for a minute. I just got to notice that if I don't plug in, we're going to lose my computer. They need to write on the next <laughs> <laughs> There have been tons of curses uttered over technology by pastors. Okay. Okay, somebody asked the question about verse 18. 18. I put that down as an insurance yet to be heard. Because if people are going to hear what happened, that's the assurance of him being heard. All right. Now, I gave you the eight elements. This is the one you really wanted. The cliff notes. In this form, there's a lament. There's petition. An expression of confidence. All right. So what I want you to do now, go find them in Psalm 13. I'll give you another three minutes. It won't even take you that long. Psalm 13. If you have to preach this psalm on Sunday and you start on Monday, you could be golfing on Wednesday. You've figured it out. All right, so you got it in two minutes. We'll even cancel the timer, right? So the lament is what verses? One and two. The petition? And the expression of confidence? Amen.
You nailed it. You pass. <laughs> we understand the form. Do we understand the psalm? Here, the issue is, the question is specifically the utterance of one who is experiencing suffering that seems determined to continue. Here, time itself becomes the destructive force, wearing down a man's ability to hold out and intensifies the suffering to human, in human level. This is a man literally at the end of his rope. As a matter of fact, he even says that in verse 3. Consider me and answer me, O Lord my God, and enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. That's not a deep sleep like Jonah, folks. This is he really literally believes he's at the end of his rope. And he's wondering how long is God going to withhold his divine assistance. Now remember, there's a key motif Van Gameren says the sufferer is alone and suffering in loneliness aggravates the anguish. How long will you hide your face from me? Now this is a theologically important statement, this idea of face. This goes back to number six in the Arianic blessing. And what does God tell Moses to bless the people with? You are to bless Israel. And part of the blessing is, may my face shine upon you and give you peace. See, when God's face is shining upon you, you have his favor, right? He's looking at you and things are good. When he turns his back on you, he's not answering you. We don't want that from God. And we've all done this, even in our personal relationships. We don't want to talk to somebody. What do we do? <laughs> but if we want to talk, if we have a right relationship, what do we do? Eye to eye. I grew up, I had two brothers and my dad, so my mom was woefully outnumbered. And at one point, I guess when we were teens, she had had it with the McGinnis boys, all of us. And I still remember we're st standing in the kitchen, giving mom a hard time, and she says, I'm not talking to any one of you now. And she literally goes like this, zipper her lip. And I said, really? And we, I started talking to mom. And she turned her back on me. I'm number one. I'm the favorite. And she looked at me and said, so for the first hour, it's kind of cute. Hey, mom's not talking to us. After three, four hours, and dinner wasn't on the table, now it started getting personal. <laughs> Mom, you're not going to cook. You're not. And she looked, she's only 5'2", but she's still trying to look over us. She turned her back on us. Now, my brothers and dad said, Mark, we have a good thing going here. Be quiet. <laughs> I was, a, I was a sensitive child, so I didn't want my mom upset with me. But when she turned back and said, talk to me, what do we say? Oh, good. Because we had her favor. And that's what God is showing us here. David doesn't feel like he's got God's favor. And again, it's not ab divine absence. It is divine silence. And the reason we know is because David is crying out to the one who says he's supposed to be hiding. And this is an extremely important concept that we can communicate to our people. And just because of time, let me just jump. See, this is what the laments do. They take all those raw emotions, whatever it is, Think about them. And the laments become the funnel to take all those emotions instead of going in nine different directions and not being harnessed for good. Anger, disappointment, grief, loneliness. And what it does is the laments funnel captures all those emotions and says, I can take every single one of them to God. And he can handle it. Because if he can handle Daniel's, David's prayers, he can handle mine. And that's what the laments are supposed to do for us. Because we live in a sin-sick world. 
we're going to suffer. It's just a matter of when, not if. What are you going to do during those times? The lament gives voice to our suffering. And it helps us in faith believe that God is going to work. Now, what I want to show you is look at the change. We have the petition in verses 1 and 2. We have the petition 3 and 4, the complaint in 1 and 2. But notice verse 5 and 6. There's a change. But I have trusted in the loving kindness. You say, what happened? Is David schizophrenic? He, what, I mean, did God answer his prayer? No. He did not answer his prayer. But he still trusted. And this is where I want to make a plug for seminary and for knowing languages. I don't mind what seminary you go to. You want to come to mind? That's great. Come to Schaefer. But in here, it says, but I've trusted. That's, in it, that's a perfect in the Hebrew. That's a perfect. And what the perfect is, it's an aspect issue. It's a one-time decision. I have trusted he puts his hand down. Says, yeah, I'm going through all these problems, but you know what? I'm going to trust. And what's he trust in? Your hesed. This loving kindness is not, oh, he loves me. Isn't that nice? No, this is covenantal loyalty. This is what God has based his relationship with Israel on. And, God's, and David says, you know what? God brought to mind that I'm in a covenant relationship with me. He's hesed with me. You know what? I think I'm going to trust that. No matter what's happening in my life, no matter if I don't see God's activity in my life, I'm still going to trust his hesed. And that's a one-time decision. Then we move to imperfects with the next two lines. I will rejoice. That's an imperfect, which means it's an ongoing action. It starts and goes on. I'll rejoice. And what's that rejoicing going to look like? I will sing. And the last line, because he has dealt bountifully with me. What in the world is he doing there? Because when he comes back to God's hesed, his relationship, he looks back in his past and says, you know what? I'm here, and it looks like God's not answering my prayer. But if I look back at my life, he's done pretty well by me. And if he has done well in the past, do I really think now is the time he's going to let me go? And all of us say, No. But I bet you every one of us has been there that we might have thought the same thing. You know what? God has never let me be late with a bill. That's legitimate. And now all of a sudden I'm concerned about being late. And he's going to let me down this time. We've been there. Or God's going to let me deal with this problem on my own. But David says, you know what? I look back on my history. I look to his word that tells me about his hesed. I look back at my own history and says, you know what? He's dealt bountifully with me the problem is I don't know how long it takes a person to get to verse 4 to verse 5 there is some ministry of the spirit that has to take place in the white space and you as a teacher you as a pastor can't tell somebody hey read these four verses and see me in the morning you should be better because this is the ministry of the spirit for that person coming to grips with their walk with God and saying Will they remember something about God? Every lament turns because there's some remembrance of God, His Word, or His activity in their lives. Now, you as a pastor, you as a teacher can help them see that. Help speak truth in their life because they're in darkness and they can't see it. And that's why it's so vitally important to get them into the Word. Especially when they feel alone. Because you can show them, hey, David felt alone too. And if David can pray this, do you think you can pray this? Yeah, but I'm not as good as David. The man was a murderer and committed adultery. Have you done either one of those two? No. Well, then I think you're on safe ground. And they take comfort and say, okay, if God didn't let David down, will he really let me down? Because I'm in relationship with him based on Jesus Christ. That is the power of laments. The Psalms do not simply express emotion. When sung in faith, they shape the emotion of the godly. See, when you pray these, it's not just a get out of jail card free. It's a expression of faith. And what do we want people to do in the midst of trials and turmoil is to express and live based on faith. By voicing these, when they sung in faith, they shape the faith. Of the godly. 
Questions, comments, criticisms? Uh, Dr. McGinnis, right here. Uh, I have a question. Um, these eight characteristics of the lament, uh, obviously we saw one psalm where one of them was missing. Do they have to go in sequence? <clears throat> Excuse me. And can they repeat? For example, Psalm 102, um, you showed uh, verses 1 and 2 were the address, but to me it looked like um, it was a petition. Mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Is that possible? Possible. And I, we, we could talk why I would not necessarily say that, but you're right. They don't have to go in order. All of them don't have to be there. Because as we saw in Psalm 13, they only have three. Because I know the first Psalm we did, it seems like a followed order. And then you had another petition, and then it went through, and then you had... Right. So that's possible. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Yeah, sometimes the lament will come first. Sometimes the petition will come first. Um... So when we're dealing with the Psalter, particularly when like public reading in the in the church, w we notice that there's dis dispensational distinctions there. And how do you view that's most appropriately dealt with? Do you just blow over it because of the commonality of our relationship with God, or is there some some psalms you might not pray together, or are you only suggesting lament psalms in pray together? My first answer is that's not a lament psalm question, so I'm not going to answer it. However. <laughs> You know, we can go, but it is a great question. Let's go to Psalm 137. <coughs> you know, this is what I want you to preach on Sunday, by the way. 137. Okay? Let me just jump down to verse 7. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the days of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. O you, daughter of Babylon, you devastated one, how blessed will be the one who repays you with the recompense which you have repaid us. How blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Amen. Let's go home. What do we do with that, pastors? I would think that's dispensational. I think there's coming a time that Israel will sing this prayer in faith. When those enemies who have gone against God and gone against Jerusalem see this. So for us, I don't think this psalm is for us. So I probably, I would just simply skip it. If I, was, I would not preach through all the psalms. You would kill your church that way, probably. <laughs> but I would not preach this psalm. If someone asked me, I would say, I think this is for a different dispensation. Because I believe during the tribulation, everything was going to go back to an Old Testament feeling. And I think this is going to be prayed by believing Jews during that time. Can we take the lessons from the Lament Psalms to narratives, and if so, how do we deal with a Naomi who complains but comes through? Yeah, see, there's a difference. Who does Naomi complain to? Didn't complain to God. And she complained to other people. And see, that's, the, that's how you know someone is dealing with their lament and grief properly. If they're in a... If they're in a attitude of prayer, praying their complaint to God, and you know that, they're on safe ground. But if someone's just complaining to you, to you, to you, always about what God's doing to them, that's somewhat tricky. And you, you know people, pastors know people like that. They're always complaining about life, and it's always God's fault. They're more like a Naomi. Naomi had to have a change of faith somewhere along the line. They said, oh, maybe God is working here. And I think it's when she starts seeing the gleaning and saying, oh, we're doing this based on the law and we're seeing God blessing, maybe there is more hope than I think. In 1993, my parents died very close together and my church gave me about four months and then it was pull up your socks. And um, a dark space settled between us for the rest of the time I was there because I didn't know how to handle being cut off from my church as well as being cut off from from God at times. So what I've learned and what I'm hearing from you is that when we can lament, we're trusting God enough that we're not worried that he's going to get mad at us for yelling at him. Because if we don't do it, then we're worried about what he's going to think about us. 
Is that? Absolutely. And you're already thinking about it in your heart. It's not like he doesn't know. I won't say it with my lips, but inside I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, but I don't know more godly than not saying it. But I don't think some people will do this because they're not sure of what's going to happen if they do. Absolutely. Because they don't understand the laments. And this idea, you know, you have four months, then get over it. I'm not over it yet. Right. And you never are. I get the feeling that uh, Paul the Apostle read these lament psalms because he says, as you're talking, I'm thinking of First Thessalonians 4, do not grieve as those who have no hope. He doesn't say don't grieve. Right. And so that's sort of a big theme that you're bringing out with these lament psalms. But we are out of time, so we're going to reconvene at 3, uh, 310. So we'll see you then.